Hello everyone, let's get started. This is a fascinating class. Um, I don't know if you have realized this already or not. Uh, because all these projects are, uh, so all, the, all of these projects and tutorials include uh, all the details about how to program a microcontroller, how to use that microcontroller to control external uh, digital circuits or analog circuits. Um, let's go to the website first. I put an initial due date for the first uh, tutorial. So you are supposed to create a lab report regarding your PCB design. If you have been in my other classes, you know how to upload your web page to you know the website. If you haven't, I think I sent an email to you guys. Have you received that email about the account and also a tutorial about how to upload your HTML lab report to the website? So in the future your lab reports will appear wait did i delete the link okay probably that's a different link all right um okay so i i probably uploaded a, a wrong link to this web page but that's fine so there should be a two links on the top it's pretty similar to this class you can see this student lab reports if you click you can see all the links and names for this uh, for this class and a grade as well I won't put your name on the grade sheet so there will be a I'm gonna assign you a three digit code it's not your student ID it's just a random code I created in spreadsheet and you will see which role belong to you and in the future you can tell what's your standing in the class so the first tutorial is pretty long actually uh, for the ones who haven't had any experience with PCB design, it can be a little bit challenging. So make sure you go through the tutorials first before you come back uh, come to this tutorial, this project tutorial. So the PCB tutorials are here. If you go to my main page and enter this tag, tutorials, and there are a couple of tutorials. So go to Eagle PCB. So no worries, it's recording. So I'm going to upload my the video here right now I'm recording to the to my website later. So I have four tutorials. So there's one, which the third one is a little bit outdated because the older version, the PCB, Eagle PCB, they used a uh, the, the name for the package as footprint, but not package. But I think if you follow, you should get everything done. It's not too different. Uh, it's just super tiny uh, minor changes on the inter user interface of the PCB Ego software. And um, then, but it's not required, right? So you, when you are following the PCB tutorials in here, you don't have to report all the steps you are going to do in, in there, in that PCB tutorial. So what you only need to do is report uh, making snapshots or put comments in the report for this specific one okay only for this one but not the general pcb tutorial because this is for one project right this is for the power supply project and you are going to create something like Okay, so that's something similar to what we're going to make in that tutorial. Uh, so that's a jack header. You plug in and you can deliver a 6 to 12 volts DC power voltage, you know, DC voltage to this board. And this part will convert this higher voltage to a lower voltages, two lower voltages. One is 3.3 volts to power, to power up. Um, 
many different kinds of whatever you want, right? So, for, for example, the ESP32, ESP8266, they are always, they are all 3.3 uh, volts for VDD. If you, you know, uh, connect a 5 volts power supply to ESP32, it will be burned. So, this PC regulator is a 3.3 volts, and this is a 5 volts PC regulator. And for these two modules, they are providing a 1 amp PC power supply. Okay, 1 amp and 3.3 volts and 5 volts. So the voltage rating is 3.3 and 5, and the current rating is, is 1 amp for both. So that's the first power module. You can see it's not, it's pretty tiny, right? It's small. Doesn't like these ones. If you compare with the commercial one, the one like I showed you last time on, on Monday. So you can tell, actually, they, these are the same regulators, the same footprint. They, they come from the same company, probably, you know, less than 50 cents for each in general. They are super popular ones. I mean, they highly recommend it. If you are working with something like this at home or you have a, um, like, lab in your garage, you have a drawer, so you must have this one in one of the drawers. It's super handy and useful. Uh, this part, the whole the entire thing here, is actually this part. Okay, can do the same job. But however, this guy cannot support three amps applications. So the current rating is too low. So I need something can support higher current devices. So that's why I have these two. So this guy is a 3.3 volts and 3 amps. This is a 5 volts, 3 amps. Okay? And they are buck inverters. We don't need to design the details about it because the vendor, which is Texas Instrument, they have a website to calculate uh, what kind of capacitor and what type of inductor you will need for this one. And in real life, when you are designing something like this for a project, you just directly go to the company's uh, website and uh, just fill in all the parameters, like the current voltages uh, in, the, in, the, in the online form, and they should give you a design immediately. So it's pretty simple to do. Um, you just put everything on one board. So after plugging with adapter, AC to DC adapter, you can have several different types of uh, voltage outputs from the from port. So that's a very simple PCB design. I think you, after you uh, design the schematic and layout for this board, you should learn a lot after after this. You know, including how to what kind of devices you're gonna pick up for the power supply and um, how to design a library. In Eagle PCB, yeah, something similar to that. Okay, and get you started. Well, from what I showed you last time, if you're really expecting you are going to have a computer engineering or electrical engineering career in the in the future, buy one of these rulers. Okay, very useful. It's not just telling you the examples of the footprint of every single different package. Like zero zero six zero three something like this, right? Not just this. It's also giving you this kind of scale, so you can measure the length of a device when you are designing a PCB library on your own. Because sometimes the Eco PCB that software doesn't have that lab uh, that component in the library. So when you are trying to design schematic, it doesn't exist in the library. So what you are going to do? You have to design one part that part in the library on your own. So then you need a ruler because all this, you know, for example, if I want to design a package for this one, it's actually just three, four pads, right? So one big pad on the top and three smaller pads. So you need to draw them physically in the layout view. And you need to know the distance, the size of the pads, all these kind of things. It doesn't have to be super accurate, okay? So sometimes this will work, <laughs> Even though it's not super accurate, it should work. Or you can find out the 
details of the, of the dimension uh, on their web on the on the vendor's website. So they all, normally they will have the data sheet to show you all the sizes for the paths and the gap and everything. So on, on the data sheet. But sometimes if you couldn't find it, you need to use a ruler to marry it so you can draw a, a layout footprint on the PCB layout view. So for example, something like this I, I, I made most recently. So that's not included in group one's pro project. Uh, if you think you can get everything done here in this group sooner, uh, you can ask me like, can I use uh, one, one project in group two to replace this project in group one? So I don't want to do this since I know how to do it. Can I use the other one to replace this one to get a credit from the, for this course? So let me know. Mostly I will agree with that. So this is one of the projects in group two. You can see that it really requires a lot of soldering skills in here and a lot of experience. Um, so for uh, most of the parts, you couldn't even solder using a soldering iron. It's pretty challenging. You have to use the hot air to blow it. Um, so first of all, you have to put this on the on the hot plate, uh, which is actually an IR hot plate uh, set up at 300 Celsius degree. So to bake it at the very beginning, and then use a the hot air blower on the top to blow it. So you can take the entire thing off from the board at the same time, at once. You can see if you just have one soldering iron, how can I take this off? You melt this pin, but you still have like three, 30 other pins are still soldered on the board, right? Just couldn't do it. You have to move your finger super fast, like the speed of light or something, which is impossible, right? You have to use a hot air to blow it on the top and bake at the bottom at the same time. So you can take this off. And also, for this little tiny, this is pretty useful for you. Let me show you. Focus. Okay, never mind. So did you see this little thing here? This guy. So that guy is a DC DC regulator, which is doing the same thing as these guys, but way smaller in size. And also it has a way better performance and plus 10 times more expensive than that one. The reason I have to use this one instead of that one, not just because of the size, it also have a way lower drop off voltage. So which means if you have, for example, I have a five volts supply and I want to stabilize everything to 3.3 volts. Using this guy is fine. But if I have a 3.7 volts from a LiPo standard LiPo battery, one cell, right? So normally a LiPo standard LiPo battery is 3.7 volts. And you want to stabilize that guy to 3.3 volts, which is required by my controllers. You couldn't use that guy to do that because the drop off, the drop out, sorry, drop out voltage is like over one volt. So which means if you have a 3.7 volts, after this 3.3 volts, you're only getting 2.7 volts, which cannot start up your microcontroller. Making sense? You have to pick up a high performance volt DC regular uh, DC regulator like this guy, but 10 times more expensive. It's super hard to solder. I was trying to kill myself when I soldered this a couple of days ago. It's, it's super hard. If you look at the footprint, they're super tiny. So I have to apply the solder paste to all the metal pads and uh, bake it on the hot plate and blow it at the same time. Um, but anyway, after I power up, this guy uses 3.7 volts, and I saw the multimeter showing 3.3 volts, I was thrilled. Plus, I was crying as well. I made it. Yeah, it, it is supposed to be soldered by machine, but you know, I, I, I can do it by hand. You just need to be super careful. Um, so compared to this guy, this one is a accelerometer, 
which is marrying accelerations and uh, uh, angular, angular velocity. So do you know what's the application for this? Accelerometers. It's a super advanced MIMAS or MAMS, which is mechanical electronic micro devices. You know, it's a super popular research field in any engineering school. I mean, it's everywhere right now. It's super popular, super hot topic. So that so they have a little tiny machine inside the chip, and which can detect or measure accelerations plus rotation speed or rotation uh, rotational velocity or angular velocity. And which is really important because you can imagine for airplane, so they can detect if the airplane is flying horizontally but not going down or going up too much. So they can measure the angle and to stabilize any object is moving or rotating, which is critical. If you want to stabilize anything like a robot or airplane or a drone, so that's the key sensor you are going to use. So if you know how to use an accelerometer like this one, which is a number one popular one in on the market right now, so in the future you are able to, you should be able to, if you see any open source online code, like design a balanced car, two wheel balanced car or a drone, or anything which requires this kind of measurement or being balanced during this computation cycle. So if you look at uh, one of the experiments I have in uh, robotics tool this semester, <clears throat> oh, not this one. All right. So that's so a two-wheel balance the car. Two-wheel balance the car. I just have one sensor, on which is that accelerometer Uno, that sensor Uno, my on this car. And uh, the MPU 6050 IMU sensor. not powered up, of and course. The system is being over. powered up by this. Uh, but however, they powered up. There's a little PID my controller. It's giving you to a little more than 12 volts DC power, DC voltage. And I'm using this. You know, barrel jack connector to forward, connect the, the wheel, voltage wheel output of roll, the battery to roll into that direction the to my controller directly because uh, my controller has a DC, five volts so finally, it DC regulator. To, you know, I think it's uh, AMS at one location. 1117. So that's the benefit so the of using a digital system because it's, will be supplied it can run to really the my controller itself the really quickly. and also the so motor driver's logic voltage input. Position, okay. So the five volts the motor comes from the AMS That's 1117 why we need to, use my controller. to supply so this is my running controller at and the logic megahertz of the, just for of this the DC very motors. fundamental Arduino and, Uno. Uh, I, 16 and the 12 volts so which also directly goes for to the voltage per second. driver's voltage input That's of why the motor drivers it. and be used one to hertz. drive the two stepper motors. And so the way it works is like this. thing is the table is not super flat. <clears throat> and you can even and put I a have water a bottle on the top. Full bottle of coffee here. It's, is this a metal? The students in that uh, class metal cup is pretty heavy. After this, they're going to design two pounds pr probably, a little robot least. or remote yeah, I'm gonna a toolstick, or maybe pass. using just Bluetooth from a smartphone so to it is still remote able to control that, so it can drive it forward, backward, left, or right. All these things. Balance. Um, right, so that's one of the per key products I'm gonna include into my company, which I haven't started yet. I planned that since three years. Okay, no problem at all. Started. So all these products go for my students. So you guys will make one product for me. I don't know which one yet. It looks but perfect. Okay. Let's so when, they, one. when you are building I mean, this prototype, I highly recommend sorry, you after you test. Can, if you guys can make it, I'll be very happy about that. So that's what I'm thinking for the final project. But let's take a look first. Um, to Lulu. So you can buy this May Solar online actually, but I was able to 
you know, make 80% done for this project last spring. But if you can, hopefully we can use this project as a final project for this course for you guys. So this is the main solar. It's not just simply a line follower. Line follower is simple. You guys can make a line follower even in circuit one, right? But this is the main solar, which means it has memory. It's a lot smarter than the line, so, uh, line follower. So here's a line maze. And it should be able to find out the exit after it explores the maze and for the first time. But the second time, it won't go through every single line. It's gonna directly follow the optimized track and get to the exit immediately. How? Right? Sounds like amazing. We hope human beings couldn't even find out the exit sometimes for the maze. How that works? Do you know how to solve a maze? If you you know, for example, for, for, for people, for kids in the park, this is a maze, and you want to get get out from the maze, what would you do? What's the, what's the trick? Huh? <laughs> so, either using the left-hand rule or the right-hand rule. So, always go to the left every time you see a curve or turn. Always turn left, and you'll finally make it. Or always turn right. It's gonna work, trust me. So if you don't think that's gonna work, search for some online you know, tutorials or games, it's gonna work. So, um, I hope we can get that done, but if not, there's another project you can, you can work on. I'm still thinking, like, let's see, let's see your progress. Um, Cause I don't know your background. Depends on what you, what you do and we can make a decision later. So, all right, so that's, uh, you know, apply in general for this course. Um, there are some tricks for Eagle PCB. So I think I should show you in, the, in this class. And then I'm gonna give the time to you guys so you can start working on the Eagle PCB. And if you have any questions, you can raise your hand. I can help you uh, in person. <clears throat> Let's go to Eagle PCB. Can I take a look if you have Eagle PCB on your desktop? Just type Eagle. You can register a student student account. I think it's free. So you can see that I have my account with uh, Autodesk. You can do it on our, by yourself as well. It's free. And you can download this software to your laptop. You have a laptop, which is highly recommended if you have it. Um, to your laptop, so you can work with this one anytime, at home or anywhere. So if you follow the PCB tutorial on my website, so the first task is to load the Spark Fun library, which is this guy. You can just follow the tutorial about how to load this Spark Fun library to our, to our Eagle PCB. So Spark Fun is a company, right, selling all these parts and kits. And you can design your own library, like what I have over here, um, because you probably couldn't find everything in SparkFun's library for your project. So it's better to have your own libraries, uh, but you wanna make different categories like capacitors, resistors, dials, microcontrollers, which is MCUs, power modules, all these different things. There's another source to, to download the library. So for example, for ESP32, uh, you couldn't find this ESP32 uh, footprint, like this guy. So that's a really popular module, ESP32. Uh, it couldn't find the, the device or the, uh, the library, the module in Eagle PCB or in SparkFun's library. So another way to do that, since there are so, it's super popular and so many people are working on that, 
So just search in Google, like ESP, Eagle, Library. So more, pretty much like 90% chance you'll find it from somewhere. Um, probably GitHub or anywhere else. Just download it and load it into your uh, into your Eagle PCB's uh, libraries folder. It's going to work. OK. So I'm not showing you this example, but let's just do it in general. So the first step, normally, you want to go to File, and New, New Project. So you want to start a new project, OK? And in the new project, let's do, do it, see how that works. So New, New Project or something, OK? <clears throat> Um, I just click the projects, and minimize this one. Did I close it? All projects is here. Um, let's close this one. Wait. Uh, where is the one I just created? Let me do it again. So that was created inside this guy, which is, I don't want to do that. I'm going to delete that one. Hmm, I want to be careful about that. I think I can delete it. Okay. So because I, I selected this guy, this tag, so that's why it's like creating that project underneath this one, which I don't want to do. So um, I'm going to just create a new one. So it's, they are in the same hierarchy, in the same level. And in this project, you can create the new schematics or ski, uh, or new board. So for example, a new schematic, you right click that project and create a new schematic. And you have <clears throat> all the parts. Since I already enabled the SparkFun library, so I have uh, uh, all the different uh, parts you can pull into your schematic view, okay? If you do not enable, so you want to go back to the control panel, you go to the library, so right click the library. There are so many other libraries, right? So if you right click, for example, this one, you can pick up to use it or not. If you do not check this box, then it is not able to show up in your schematic when you are trying to find some parts for your schematic. So keep in mind, sometimes you have a, the Spark Funds library loaded to your Eagle PCB, but however, you go to your schematic, you couldn't find that part from here because you didn't check that box. You need to enable it. So that's one trick you need to know. Another thing I'm going to show you, which is uh, one of the tricks of making all the parts, so, for example, you go to libraries. Let me show you. Probably the capacitor can be a pretty standard one. I, I can show you how that works. So you can see the library. This is these are all the devices I have. So device means it's a combination of a schematic and layout. So the layout is something here you can see, or you can say the name for layout is called footprint. Eagle PCB. So the footprint are these guys. So capacitor, that's a symbol of the capacitor. But definitely you are not fabricating this guy, this shape onto a PCB. The reason is your capacitor looks like this. So that's uh so this is a capacitor using that package. Did you see? It's uh this kind of shape. And has two paths, one on this side, one on the other side. You just put put this uh, capacitor on on the, on the top of this uh, shape and solder here and here. Then you are done. OK. 
Okay, so that's what you need on the layout view. So that's why here is a footprint will be physically fabricated on the PCB. If that has here is a metal metal pad, another metal pad. So you can solder your capacitor on the top of this shape. So that's why this is called the footprint of the layout. That's a symbol. It's being used for schematic. It's not being physically fabricated on the PCB. It's just a symbol for real view. It's just like uh, looking. It's not nothing else. However, <clears throat> you may have one uh, footprint to be used for different devices. So now I'm trying to explain the three concepts. It can be a little bit confusing at the right beginning, okay? See, device, footprint, symbol. I'm not using this 3D package. We, we don't need it for now. So device, footprint, symbol, okay? So that's a footprint. You can use a one microfarad capacitor using this footprint. You can also have a 100 microfarad capacitor use the same footprint. So do you need to create different footprints for different capacitors? Nope. You just create one footprint, which defines the size, the gap, the distance, and everything for the metal stuff to be fabricated on the PCB. Okay? So, for example, you have the final result will be you have a library, have a long list of all different footprints. And also you have a list of all different symbols. And you need a device which will pick up this symbol and this footprint. You make a combination and you create a device. And that device will be used in the library, in your library. So when you are designing a PCB, you can find that device in the library and pull it to a schematic. And why? Why is that? Do you need a symbol for every different capacitor? No, why? All the capacitors look the same in terms of symbol. Just two doors, two wires. So you just need to create one symbol, just one symbol for all the capacitors. Is that making sense? And one footprint for all that specific packages because you have different packages. If you look at this guy, so there are actually so the capacitors, all these big capacitors look the same, but actually they are different, slightly different from, depends on which company makes it, right? So, <clears throat> frozen. You can see, see this one. This one is a little bit taller than this one. So probably it's a little bit bigger as well for the footprint. And you can see this guy is, is you know, in terms of diameter is, you know, bigger than this one. So which means they have different what? When you're designing a PCB or device for them, they have a different what? They have a different is one is this size, and you want to fabricate that circle on the PCB. Another one have a this size, and you want to fabricate that circle, that kind of thing on the PCB. So they are all capacitors, but they have a different what? Footprint. So that's why you probably need to design a couple of different footprints available on the market. So, and different types of symbols. But not probably not too many different symbols. Let's look at the, look at the software. So here is a uh, what's the name of that? It's not pantalon. It's not pantalon. It's a uh, uh, electrolyte capacitor. So it has uh, it's polarized. So have an anode and cathode. So you need to uh, you need the other side of the capacitor to be a little bit curved in the arc for the other side, right? If it's a ceramic capacitor, there are two straight bars. So let me know how many types of, how many different symbols you need for all capacitors, as you know. How many symbols do you need for any capacitor you are going to create in your Eagle PCB? Hmm? Two. Why? Which two? The one with two straight bars? 
which doesn't have a polarity. The other one has a straight bar and a curved bar. Just two symbols can be applied to any capacitors on the market. So I actually just need, you know, a polarized and non-polarized symbol for any other device that you're going to make. Doesn't matter if it's one microfarad, two microfarad, a hundred microfarad, doesn't matter. They are sharing the same symbol. So when you are looking at the library, when you're designing a schematic, you open the library trying to find out the one microfarad capacitor. Are you trying to take the symbol from the library or the footprint from the library or the device from the library? So for example, let's try it. Um, okay, I'm just gonna use uh, one of the schematics I have. For example, yeah, let's do the new program maybe either. Uh, yeah, it seems like I didn't save that one. <clears throat> let's do this. Schematic. Okay, for example, this guy. And I, for example, I'm trying to add a new device. All right, you will forget it. So I'm going to grab a capacitor to here. Here's a capacitor. I want to look, put this capacitor to my schematic. Okay, I click, click OK. So here's a cap. All right? You single click, place it to your schematic. So you can see this device carries the information of here's a symbol and if I go to the board view here's a footprint of that cap and also at the same time it has a value which is 4.7 microfarad I may have a 20 microfarad capacitor using the same symbol and same footprint, right? But just a different value. So when you are creating a new device, you open that library manager and there are all these symbols and packages available for you. And you click new device. And I'm gonna use this symbol and this footprint for that device and you give a name to that device, for example, 4.7 microfarad, or 20 microfarad, or 100 microfarad, doesn't matter. So you can create that device to be saved in your library. So next time, when you open the library to find out this device, you can see it's a 4.7 microfarad you know, capacitor. So again, here's the question. When you are looking at anything in the library, are you trying to pull a symbol or pull a footprint or pull a device from the library. When you open the library, like here, I click library, I find out this part, and I select that, and OK, again here. So am I taking a symbol or a footprint or a device? device. Great. Make sense? So when you are designing your own library, do you need to design a hundred symbols for all the different values of capacitors? No. For all the polarized capacitors, just one symbol. Because schematic is not, so for all the different values of the capacitors, it's the same shape, same, same symbol. That is the same concept for the footprint in the layout view. Like this PCB. Here's the evil thing. <laughs> the tiny DC voltage regulator I used. <clears throat> you know, this, this is a 0603 uh, footprint. Uh, that's for capacitors or resistors, whatever. So all these devices, they are already small enough. But if you compare to this guy, see all the paths. It's pretty 
pretty hard to, to solder. So here's an accelerometer, and that's a ESP module. Okay, so that's uh, the tricks about uh, Eagle PCB. Let me see if there's anything else I can tell you. Okay, so we are making two layer PCBs, only two layers. Top layer and bottom layer. So the top layer shows all the right color. So they are the right color is the top. If you see one top, which means the first layer, top layer is the copper layer. So that's all the traces and paths on this top view are made by copper. 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 Copper, right? Copper. I came from the, the country which speaks the third worst English in the world. You must be wondering who are the first and second. I won't tell you. <laughs> I won't tell you they are Korea and Japan. So Sorry for that. You have to bear with me my, 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 my accent. <laughs> I've been trying. The bottom layer here are the blue traces at the bottom, which means you only have two layers, but you know you can fabricate up to 40 layers of metals. But it's just more expensive. Right? We are not making 40 layers or even four layers PCBs. So two layers means that's the bottom layer, as a top layer, so just two layers of metals. In the middle, there are any other materials which are not conductive. And if they need to uh, route the traces at the bottom, they will just directly drill a hole, like this tiny hole. They'll drill a hole, and the hole will be made by metal, so they can conduct the electric signal to the bottom, so they can route the traces at the bottom. Two layer PCB, pretty simple, and Super cheap. So we can make, it's pretty much $1 for uh, each board. And for every design, if you are getting, it's actually less than, less than $1. Because I, uh, if you pick up 10, 10 pieces, 10 boards, something like this size, it's only $5 for 10 pieces. And the shipping, the shipment is $18, and the board is only $5 for 10 pieces. Um, I mean, for for everybody in the U.S., nobody is making PCBs here anymore. I used to make one big PCB uh, in my PhD the first year. It's a, probably four times bigger than that. Cost me like 200 bucks just for making one. Oh, two, probably three boards, I forgot. But 200 bucks. Because I didn't know there, there was a couple of companies in China are making PCBs. And uh, not just us, and all the companies here in the U.S. are making PCBs over in China because it's super easy and fast and cheap. Okay, um, we are going to make, so you are going to design a couple of different PCBs, but we will probably make one or two, at least one for each of you. I'm going to pay that for you, okay? You are going to send the design to the company and to fabricate it. It takes about 10 days to receive the board after you send the design to them. And at least one, okay? That's a required that's re required for this class. You can have different types of PCB designs, but they will be in Eagle. But you, you, you will have at least one or two, probably at least one. If you can make two, which is great, but at least one will be fabricated and being soldered and tested. I think that's all I want to tell you for you know how to use Eagle PCB. Any other questions? See what's the deal day for this project? September the fourth, right? Here's one thing I forgot to mention. I think I made a mistake in this tutorial. <clears throat> Let me show you what is that. It's good to know. 
for this part, which is actually these two guys, okay, the DC regulators. If you look at the layout, right? So this guy and this guy. This metal plate should be shorted to the ground. It's being used, it's a ground, it's a ground pin. At the same time, it's used for heat dissipation. Keep in mind, for every single power module, you need to have a bigger metal plate or a big metal, or a, you know, anything similar to that. It doesn't have to be super, super big, but it will, you need a metal plate to uh, dissipate the heat from the power module, because the power module is creating a lot of uh, heat. So all, uh, every single part on your PCB is being powered up by that single module. So that's why it's, it's going to be hot if you do not have this kind of uh, uh, heat sink. And if you do not draw a solder, uh, what's that called? Solder mask stop. So the name of that part in, in, in here in layout is, it's not in here in the library. So I'm going to show you later, no worries. So we need to draw a line here to not allow them pour this blue paint over the metal so you can have an exposed copper you can solder to. Is that making sense? So you can see all these copper traces are being covered by this blue paint. It doesn't have to be blue. You can design a black one, whatever you can request from the company. But other, you know, some, some of the color like uh, purple probably will charge you for some actual money. But blue, white, black, and green are free. So we can see the paint is covering all the metal traces. So they are not being shorted by any other wires on the outside world. So if you do not draw that T-stop, it's called T-stop in your layer when you're designing that device. T, just letter T, and stop. So that's the top stop. So when they are uh, pouring the blue paint or any other color of paint to the board, it's going to stop the paint to be covered to that shape, specific shape. You'll see that T-stop in your um, library uh, view. When you are making the device, you'll see that. So make sure you draw a square to cover that metal so it will be exposed. But I didn't draw that. I thought uh, that line here, um, no, here, I was thinking this line is a different layer with a different name. I thought this one will do the job, but actually it didn't. So even though I drew this layer, I, I forgot the name of this layer. It was showing on, the, on one of the tutorials online, but it's not working. So this one would not stop the paint. Okay, you do need a T-stop. So T means top, T-stop. If you want to draw this on the bottom, you need a B-stop, bottom stop. Keep in mind. So that's why I even checked on the website. Here is a PCB view. Uh, it's a sub, it's a free website. You can load your PCB file to the website and look at what's gonna look like, what this PCB will look like after the fabrication. And I forgot to check solder mask. So solder mask is a paint. If I check this one, then we'll see there is no uh, there's a solar mask on the top of the copper. So I won't fabricate it, but actually I, I forgot to check because I, I, I believe that what, whatever the tutorial told me, but it's not working actually. So that's uh, everything you need to know, I think, to proceed. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me. And if you have any other ideas about the project, okay, you can, also you can let me know. Um, so on Friday, you are not coming to here, but you are supposed to work on this anywhere else, right? So probably in the study room or anywhere else. So that will be here in the class. And after class, you can ask me questions. But you just have a due day. Make sure you have, have everything uh, submitted to the website by before this time.
pretty much one week. Would that be enough? Let's see. All right, um, that's everything I want to tell you. You still have uh, four minutes, I guess, right? You can leave your like or questions. On the is here. Yeah, it's here. GitHub. Yeah. Yeah. So so were you here? Mm -hmm. I think I have a link to it as well. Okay. The version I'm using can be found here. Yeah, download it on GitHub. Download the zip. And then place it. So, so you want to add a path in directory on Eagle. And also you want to place the zip file. Let me take a look at your, your software. So 